Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. <laughs> and this is not coming. Welcome to <laughs> Strange and Beautiful Book Club. I wonder how long it will take after we have concluded coming 81 kilo for me to stop saying, and this is literally years. I like your vote of confidence. It really feels like you have. You're consistent. I am, I'm consistent in inconsistency. So today we are talking about a hidden gem. Go figure, because it's sort of what our podcast is marginally about. <laughs> Like, to be marginally about anything? Um, you know, yes, we do. We have a theme. We talk about what we bangers. Are. Bangers, yeah. Um, regardless of where we find them or how obscure they are. In fact, the more the obscure, the better. And considering this gem of a movie that we're about to talk about made, according to IMDb, roughly fourteen thousand dollars in gross, it feels like a hidden gem to me. And you know what? Okay, so first of all, we're talking about before I get off on a soapbox bubble tangent about what I'm about to do. Um, we are going to talk about Radius, which was released in 2017, starring Diego Clattenhoff, Charlotte Sullivan, Brett Donahue. Um, there's more people listed in the crew, but honestly, those are the only characters. So it's like an elevator movie. It's that's an it. elevator movie in like three locations. So um yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Diego Klattenhoff is actually fairly successful. He was in the blacklist, evidently. And on IMDb, he's listed as being in 218 out of 218 episodes. So that oh. feels like success to me. And then Charlotte Sullivan has been in a couple of things. In fact, she was in Rookie Blue, which is a fairly popular Canadian procedural television show, who's, which also stars none other than Ben Bass. A.K.A. Really? Javier Vachon of Forever Night of the 90s mom hair wig. So there's a connection back to Forever Night for you. But you know the thing that gets me about this movie? First of all, if you're going to watch this movie, go watch it right now. Do not listen to us describe it and then go and watch it. I feel like this is a movie that you need there's to a watch. really effective. Cold. Yeah. You got to watch. Don't read the description. Never mind. Nothing. I won't even say anything more than that. No. Watch no, it. Just go find it. It says it's on Peacock, according to whatever, the internet, I guess. Whatever. Like, it's not the internet. And I watched it on Amazon Prime when we still had the Prime streaming service, and I think it was included in Prime, so you can just go and watch it. Go. Stop. Go now. Don't read the trivia either, because there's a major spoiler in the trivia, which is not labeled as a spoiler on IMDb. So don't go do it. We'll wait. We'll be here when you come back. Pause it here. Okay, welcome back. I'm glad you went and watched it. <laughs> Hopefully you went and watched it and you're not cheating. You're not cheating, right? I can see you if you're cheating. It's part of my mom skills. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can't. Maybe I can, but I can't, but maybe I can. So um, I think the thing that bothers me the most, which I've said four times, but now I'm finally going to finish that thought, is how uh, slandered this movie is on IMDb. Really? Yeah. I have not looked up any of the, I don't know, internet commentary on this movie. I've only watched the movie with you, and that's all I know about it. Yeah. Well, because I was like, hey, check this shit out. And you were like, cool. Because I watched it, and then it was so good, I wanted to go back and watch it again. Yeah. Um, I would have turned around and watched it from the beginning again as soon as I finished it. Because there's a lot of uh, breadcrumbs, I guess, that I wanted to go back and like watch and look for. It's loading right now. So on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 93% tomato meter. Nice. But on IMDb, it has a 6 out of 10 stars. 
Mm. And I was reading some of the reviews, some of the lower rated reviews, because like, what the fuck? Um, why is there such a discrepancy? And on IMDb, there's a lot of, it had a really cool premise, but it just didn't pay off. And I'm not sure what check you thought they were cashing, but it really feels like it got me where I wanted to go. I felt satisfied at the end of this movie. There was nothing that was like, eh, I didn't want it to end that way. Or I felt like there was a lot of setup and it didn't pay off. I thought it was good. I liked the ending. And I don't normally like tragic endings. And I liked the ending of this movie. Yeah, it it wrapped everything up. There was, it didn't like lead back to some like huge, probably people wanted it to be like a, oh, secret government research project produced a super soldier kind of thing. Yeah. But no, it, and it's not aliens. Um, it's just, what if there was some freak cosmological event that boom this happened yeah to these random people yeah it's because how it happened to them is utterly irrelevant it is what right. happened to them that's and interesting. who it happened to and who it happened to and it's just like well you got struck by super lightning fuck fine that's great yeah you got struck by super lightning i'm here great cool i'm glad and that memories got wiped up. yeah it it did such a number on you, you forgot who you were. Okay, cool. And I thought the slow reveal of memory was an excellent MacGuffin. Like, it was an excellent thing to lead us through this. Especially, um, there's the whole thing with the missing poster. Mm -hmm. And the first time she sees herself holding the paper, it's blank. And then the next time she sees herself holding the paper, it's her picture. But there's, there's writing, but the writing isn't intelligible. And then again, we come back and this time she can see the writing on the paper and she knows what it says. And I thought that was such a great, like, every time we revisit this memory, it gives us the implication that this memory is more fully realized. Yeah, it's a little bit clearer. Yeah. And so our two main characters are Liam and Jane. And we start with Liam and Liam wakes up. And he's on the side of the road and he has no idea who he is and he has no idea what's going on. And every single character in this movie got to act intelligently and we still got the movie moving forward. So that's already that's better. That's already better than like the last four movies we've watched <laughs> because he's immediately like, OK, and he pulls out his wallet and checks his driver's license. And his driver's license has his name on it. And he's like, okay, I'm Liam. And then he ends up um, trying to wave down a car. And then the car veers off the road, almost hits him. And when he checks the lady behind the wheel, she's dead. And he's like, oh, shit. So he takes her cell phone and he calls 911. And he's like, I'm, I have no idea where I am. And he like describes the crossroads and he realizes he not only doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know anything. And so ultimately he makes his way to a diner to try to find out who he is and figure out what's going on. And when he gets to the diner, everyone in the diner is dead. And for a little while, he thinks it's some kind of airborne pathogen because that's what they're saying on the radio. But he yeah. very quickly realizes, oh shit, I think this is me. And then he's like, okay, well, what are the parameters? And he works out the parameters like immediately. And then he's like, well, I guess I'm just going to hide right, in this with, shed. Uh, with birds. Yeah, with birds. They had so many dead bird props in this movie <laughs> that they got to just splat. Like they made like a sound every time they fell. And they got, they used them a lot. And he's like, well, I think I'm going to hide in my shed, which maybe is not like, I don't know what his game plan was, but what do you do? You find out that anyone within like 20 to 30 feet of you dies. Right. Anyone who comes within 20 to 30 feet of you dies immediately. You have no idea why. You have no idea who you are. You found your house only by virtue of the fact that your address is on your driver's license. And... What? Like, who do you call for help? What do you do? So while he's hiding there, he hears this woman coming. And he's like, no, no, leave. 
don't come over here, leave, which we get a couple cool tense moments where people are coming towards him and he's freaking out a little bit because if he runs, they're going to chase him. But if they catch him, they'll die. But he's actually trying to save them. But no one's going to believe him because who's going to believe that you die instantly if you come closer to him? And then this woman arrives and she just walks right up to him. And then a dog comes with her and the dog doesn't die either. And he's like, oh, great, I'm cured. Woo, that passed. Woo. Well, of course, you find out that he's only better when she is with him. Right. Which and we find out when he gets pulled over. They also have more chemistry than literally anyone that I have read in the last five books I've read. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like... Oh, thank God. Like, uh, they work really well together. They are two actors who have to carry the weight of this entire narrative. And I really think they do a really good job. Yeah, definitely. This is an itty bitty, tiny little budget movie. They have limited things to work with. They've got a couple of old cars. They've got some public settings that are probably free or cheap or, you know, used on the down low. So uh, it it works. It's really great. It's suspenseful. It's engaging. And the fact that all of these people are like, I don't feel like it had a payoff. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what ending you wanted. The non the non supernatural plot is is complete. Yeah. Right. We get. We get this lady, basically, I guess we have the guy, the Liam. serial killer, yeah, stalking this woman. Boom, something happens. They both lose their memory, and they are drawn back to each other Yeah, with no memory. And then we find out, oh, he's also the one. Oh, oh and she was looking for her Twin sister. sister, yeah. So now... We have these two people with no memory. They do some stuff together. And then we find out that he abducted her twin sister and killed her. And then he was stalking her. Intending to do the same thing. And he got interrupted. And then. Super lightning. So, right. But then um, in the end, she got some closure. Yeah. About her sister. Right. And he got removed from the equation. Yeah. Uh, the su the serial killer thing is the big twist at the end. And that's what's in the IMDb spoilers. Like that's what's in the IMDb trivia, which is not labeled as a spoiler. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost sad that I read through the trivia as I am wont to do. <laughs> and uh, I got it spoiled because I think that would, I mean, it was still impactful. I still was like, oh God, that's awful at the end. But still, I think I would have been even more like, what? No. Yeah. It was really effective yeah. when he's at his little cabin going through his, I don't know, memory book and uh, his, his scrapbook. He's going No, he through. remembers because he's out on the boat. And he throws that ring, he throws that tarp ring in the water, and he remembers throwing people in the water. She's the one who's going through the memory book. Oh, okay. She finds his scrapbook. Yeah, she finds his, like, serial killer trophy scrapbook, and which the trophies are missing posters. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's out on his boat, and then he remembers, and he's like, no. No, and that moment is so heartbreaking, and it's so well done, and it's so emotive, because this is such an intimate movie. You're only seeing these two characters. You're not distracted by a whole lot of flash and bang. It's literally just these two people trying to figure out what the fuck is happening to them. And here's a basically good dude who is responsible for the death of, like, dozens of people, Not he, and he doesn't want to be. Right. That time when he gets arrested and he gets separated from her and they're dragging him out of the building and he's like, please, everybody run. You're going to die. Like, you've got to go. And then he gets far enough away from her and, yeah, everybody around him dies. And he's just like, no. And he starts crying. And it's so sad. And she tells him later, she's like, you know that none of that's your fault. And he's like, yeah, there's really only a certain amount of time that I can tell myself that. And then it's not true anymore. And then you find out he's a serial killer. And the reason that that's his superpower is because she was trying to stop him from killing people. And he was trying to kill people. 
And so when super lightning happened, he got the superpower, kill everybody. And she got the superpower, stop him from killing everybody. Right. And it makes sense. Is it the best narrative device to give these people these powers ever? No. Does it matter? It works. Also, no. Because you're like, okay, cool. Like, I didn't even really need an explanation. We could have gone without knowing. And I think I would have been just fine. We could have just found that dark circle. Right. And then you could have like, just had it be, oh, there's this dark circle. We don't even know what happened. Yeah. Was it was it aliens? Was it cosmic rays? Was it government research? Yeah. Was it mutants? We don't we don't need to know. Right. It's just, okay, here's something that happened that bound these two people together. Right. And boom. Boom. Side effects. And I think maybe people wanted like the signal, like a payoff, like in the signal where it was like, oh, it's an alien race and they're on this alien spaceship and blah, blah, blah. You know, the buildup in the signal where mystery upon mystery upon mystery, and then you get all your answers and actually all the answers kind of suck. Like, (laughs) I kind (laughs) of wish we hadn't gotten any answers and we just left it creepy and unsettling. I think people wanted, they wanted the wrap up, like the big, oh, it was this plausible thing that happened and we had this big wrap up and there was all these other extra characters that get introduced. And instead it's just an intimate movie about these two people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time who had this terrible thing happen to them. One of them deserved it and one of them didn't. Yeah. And at the end, the one in the end, he kills himself because she's going to be stuck with him forever because If she leaves his side, people will die. And he doesn't want anybody to die because he's not the same man. Right. Without his memories, he's not the same person. Yeah, he's not the same person. He doesn't want to go back to being that person. He doesn't want there to be the chance that he will go back to being that person. And also, he will forever be the man that killed her sister. Even if he has no memory of it and he's not that person anymore, he is the one who killed her sister. And if he doesn't remove himself from the equation, she is stuck with him forever. And so she he shoots himself in the head. Yeah, at the hospital. At the hospital. And I love that ending. I think if we'd left the ending open, I would have hated it. Right. And if they'd both died, I would have hated it. But I think him deciding... I'm going to take this chance and I'm going to go out better than who I was. I love. And I think this was such a sweet, neat, simple thriller, like mystery mystery thriller, kind of horror, like a psychological horror almost. Yeah. Yeah, but it was so clean. It was clean and entertaining and you could sit down and watch it and it's like, oh, that was that was good. And then you could watch it again and be like, wow, that was good again. I don't feel overtaxed. I don't feel overwhelmed. I don't feel like it was trying to throw too much imagery at me all at once. It was really just a nice little entertaining movie. And sometimes those are absolutely wonderful to stumble across. Mm -hmm. The, okay, I'm going to put on this thing that's promising to be this psychological horror. Okay, I think all of the descriptions say anybody who comes within 50 feet of him die. So it's that's not even really like a reveal. Although I kind of wish they hadn't put that in the description either. Yeah. Because it takes him a while to work it out. It'd be nice if it took you a while to work it out too. Like if you could realize that at the same time as him, that would be like, oh, sh- oh shit, that's great. It's kind of like when we talked about Hal Dane's book and he mentions that OG is in all of the sections. And mm-hmm. I was like, man, kind of wish he hadn't told me that. Right. It's still good, but I was shocked. I didn't know it, and then I was shocked when he came back. It would have been nice for everybody to be shocked when he comes back. Hashtag spoilers are a con- I have a, I have a complicated relationship with spoilers. So anyway, we haven't done a good independent movie in a while. And I wanted to mention that I got mad and canceled all of our streaming services because I am who I am. And I accepted it long ago and I will accept no criticism. So I just am who I am. And instead we got Tubi. And apparently Tubi is like the haven for independent movies. 
because they'll stream just about anything because the way they get revenue is through ads. So the more stuff they have to stream, the better off they are because the more ads people will watch. Right. And I'm really looking forward to finding a bunch more independent movies on Tubi for us to watch that are like Radius. Right, where it was a really small project. Yeah. And there's only, I think, one scene with any like computer special effects. Yeah, super lightning. Yeah, otherwise it's all just, just plain old acting and sets. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought it was really good. I thought the... Um... The evolution of their relationship was really good because they're sort of, she doesn't remember anything about who she is. She actually got picked up and taken to the ER and because they didn't know who she was at the ER and she didn't have any kind of identification and nobody came to report her missing, they were going to take her to like a shelter to stay. Until right, they like could a homeless out. shelter, right? Yeah. And so she just left and she came there forget why she came to that place. Oh, I think maybe his name. I think she had a piece of paper with his name on it from his truck. Or she could only remember him. And so they kind of figure maybe they have something. They don't, but they also kind of do because these two characters have really good chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be, I just, I love the idea of having more of these nice, it's 90 minutes. I love a fucking 90 minute movie. I mean, I know. What's the one that just came out? The Flowers of the Death God or something? The one with... <laughs> what? No, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio. The Killers of the Flower Moon or something. Sorry, I'm not on the same the same feet as you. I don't see that kind of <laughs> it stuff. It was like the release of the year or something. <laughs> uh, you mean Dune Part 2? Oh, yes, right. No, Killers of the Flower Moon. That's what it was called. And it was... It made... Not made history, but it, everyone was all up about it because it's three hours and 26 minutes long. And it played in theaters, clocking in at three and a half hours long. Nice. And um, I don't know about you, but my bladder is approximately two hours <laughs> if I'm pushing it. So... If you've prepared. If I've prepared. If you purged yourself. I, I am unhydrated. I drink appropriately nothing. Appropriately beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, uh, I mean, I get it. I get the appeal of these highbrow, oh, I'm going to sit for three and a half hours and watch Leonardo DiCaprio jack off or whatever he did in Killers of the Flower <laughs> Moon because I'm never going to watch it because it looks like the most dude movie. I have a thing about dude movies. I hate dude movies. I hate the idea of dude movies. And I have this psychological block about movies that I perceive as dude movies. And like, I know even if I force myself to watch them 95% of the time, I still hate them. It's movies like There Will Be Blood, No Country for Old Men. What? I know, how, I know Javier Bardem is in it and I know you enjoy it and you've made me watch parts of it and it was just fine, but it's a dude movie. It is. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer. The list goes on. These are all movies that I know myself. I don't feel the need to psychologically traumatize myself by sitting through these dude movies. I love that you like some of those that I just listed off. I deeply, deeply love that you had no idea what Killers of the Flower Moons is because... I feel like we are the farthest from a film bro podcast that you can get. And every time you confirm it, it gives me a thrill of joy that I am not married to a film bro. I don't know how to describe but you. But Leo. <laughs> but he dates those 20 year old chicks. <laughs> Hashtag winning. Hashtag winning. He just dumps one and then he gets another one. It's so great. And every time people tease him about it, he's like, well, you're not wrong. You're like, God, you are such a weird, lecherous old man. I don't know. I try to not give a shit about most actors unless they are like a predator. Right. I try not to be concerned. I mean, yes, he's dating young women, but they are young women who are legally adults. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but it is legal. So, okay. But he's the one that I'm like, oh, dude, come on. Do you just not like having a conversation with an older woman? 
Do you not like a woman who's old enough to push back? I don't understand. I don't get it. What's the appeal of the younger woman? I don't know. You're like, I, well, I'm younger than you. So you, you're robbing the cradle. I'm a whole like 16 months younger or something. <laughs> what am I like a year and two months or something? 14 yeah. months and 14 months younger than you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a period of time during the year when you're two years older than me. <gasps> Scandalous. Does that fit the, what is it, half times seven or? Yeah, half plus seven. Half plus seven. Is the limit. Yeah, so I think we're good. I think yeah. we're good. <laughs> Matt's like, why are you having a dude conversation with me? I am unarmed. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I was having a conversation with somebody on Instagram about it. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't watch dude movies. And they were like, yeah, I get it. And I'm like, Matt's not even helpful because he also doesn't watch dude movies. I can't give you any context. No. Every once in a while, you'll like sneak one in. You're like, oh, yeah, I watched X dude movie. And I'm like, that's I'm, I'm happy for you. But also, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I don't care to watch those movies. I care that you like those movies. I don't care about those movies. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because the conversation is about men so much in the rest of my life that then when I go to the movie, I don't want it to also be about men. It's literally like watching, like I was about to say, it's like watching dudes suck each other's dick, but I think I'd probably be more entertained by that, honestly. But it's more like... You watched Brokeback Mountain without me. I did. I did. I I put it on at night. <laughs> I put it on at night thinking, okay, I'm going to fall asleep to this. And then I was like, why did I put this on? This is... I, this is why I know, I, you came to bed and you're like, I don't know why I did that to myself. I, don't know why I, did that. <laughs> I feel really sad now. I don't I know. I probably would have liked it because I like tragic movies. Yeah. But I still haven't seen it. I kind of want to, I don't want them to remake Brokeback Mountain in that Break, Brokeback Mountain was not good. And I don't, I think Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger did a great job. But. The way that we portray queerness in movies has evolved so much since Brokeback Mountain. I think Jake Gyllenhaal crushes it. I think Heath Ledger does a great job, but I do think Heath Ledger's portrayal is bordering on dated. Not bordering on dated in that he doesn't... I'm trying to hedge this in. It's a good movie. They did a great job. It's earned every single accolade it's ever gotten. But he just plays sad. Like, okay. I'm sad. I'm sad that I don't get to be with my man friend. I'm sad and lonely and traumatized and withdrawn. But I think he has like four lines of dialogue in the whole movie. <laughs> because he's just so stoic you know what I mean and I just I want there to be a moment where he reads as queer and he never reads as gay he does like one moment Jake Gyllenhaal shows up and he ends up making out with him because he's so excited that he's to see him and in that moment you're like okay but it's also like I'm kissing you but I hate myself right now and I wanted him to be able to completely melt into that moment of reunion. And I don't feel like he does. And I feel like a more modern view of queer portrayal would give him more leeway to not be like, oh, I'm sad because I like dudes. <laughs> does that make and sense? And that's a bad thing. And that's a bad well, it's thing. Been a, it's been something I've been prevented from exploring because of the time in which I live. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I I don't know. I just want to see how it would be treated now, I guess. Like, I want to see what a modern, a modern act, like a modern director, modern actor sensibilities, mm -hmm. uh, modern, like what is allowed and what is not allowed. Because, I mean, when that movie came out still, I mean, maybe The Birdcage, but, and Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything. But we were kind of in this needle swing where you could have queer characters but only if they were tragic because we tested out the comedic queer characters and mm. now we were okay well what if they're all tragic and sad and yeah. so i want to make it in a oh we swung back to the middle where they get to be three-dimensional people with more than one 
with more than one emotion and more than one thing that we portray. Mm-hmm. And I know we've wandered far afield from Radius, but I mean, I don't know. What podcast did you think we were listening, you were listening to? <laughs> well, I think because Radius is so straightforward and simple, what I'm saying is just go fucking watch it and then go find some more nice 90 minute independent films. Cause I think we've watched a couple independent films on Tubi and I'm consistently impressed I think that's where the most innovative and interesting voices are right now. Right. And if you cut yourself off from them because you're afraid of of special effects or whatever, you're missing out. And I think it's a really simple, sweet chemistry story, too, about how two people put together in a desperate situation can end up connecting in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. And then for her to find out that he's actually the bad guy is fucking soul crushing because. Right. Because they were falling in love. Because they were. She was like, listen, if I have to spend the rest of my life imprisoned with you, I don't think I'll care. Right. That's not such a bad thing. And this is after she meets her husband, because eventually she realizes she's married. and Her husband is looking for her. And she goes to him and he's like, oh, my God, you're back. Thank you. And he's really jealous of Liam because she's really connected to Liam right now. And she tells him, "Um, I don't know who you are. I don't know you. Right. How can you expect me to love you? I don't even know who you are. And he's our only other character, really. And he's the one who calls the police and we get that sweet scene where they get arrested and pulled apart and... He ends up killing all those people on accident. And I just thought that there were so many good moments in this movie. And I think when you add so many special effects and you add so much kerfuffle, you just lose all these sweet little moments. And a movie can be made up of these little moments and it be a really good movie. Like I watched Labyrinth the other day and I live stitched it. (laughs) I live threaded it i don't know i I was having a really good time but uh you know 80s movies were really good on putting together movies out of little moments like if you think about labyrinth it is a string of small events it's the goblin king taking toby it's her going to the goblin king's kingdom and then she meets the worm and every Every interaction is just this small uh, moment. It's a small moment that gradually shifts her perception yeah, of what her situation is in relation to her brother and what she actually wants. Right. And it's a hero's journey. She gathers yeah. a party as she goes, but it's not, there's no big moment. I mean, honestly, the only big moment is at the end with the siege of the Goblin City, and I forget it happens every single time because it's my least favorite part of the movie. <laughs> and I think you could cut it out and it you wouldn't lose a single thing. Yeah. It's it's honestly the weakest section in the movie. Or you think about The Crow, which The Crow is early 90s. And The Crow is so iconic and it is so beautiful and apparently the remake is coming out in July. Oh. With Bill Skarsgård as Eric Draven. Okay. And I don't know how I feel because if I have a movie that is sacred to me, it is probably The Crow. And it is, again, another series of small moments. Of course, the small moments are him murdering people, but it is what it is. And then I guess we get the payoff again where we get the big showdown at the church at the end. But again, that's the part that I'm like, Meh. I don't care. It's fine. Whatever. The call, call, bang, fuck, I'm dead. Like, that's the funniest part in that whole section. <laughs> and then, if, but if you cut it out again, uh, you might lose seeing the bad guy lose, but that's about it. And there's no big moment at the end of this movie, at the end of Radius. And maybe that's why I like it so much, because there's no part at the end where I'm like, oh, checked out for a minute. Right. Now. We don't have a big shootout or anything. Yeah. Blade Runner does the same thing. It's a series of small events. And then we have the big showdown with Roy ba- Roy Beatty, Batty, Roy Batty in the, in the abandoned apartment building. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm like, nah, that's all right. And, and even that, it's pretty much just chase. Yeah. And 
it's chase with monologue. Yeah. Where the the valuable part of that, of that chase, a little bit of fighting and monologue is monologue. Monologuing. Yeah. The point is the monologue because it gives character like character depth. Yeah. And Harrison Ford is doing nothing but like grunting and heavy breathing through the whole thing. Right. While Roy is like uh, monologuing, especially when he gets to the end. The part that finally gets good is when he like puts the nail through his hand to try to keep his hand awake. Mm-hmm. And then he has his iconic thing on the roof where he talks about, you know, the things I have seen, all those moments will be lost. I read that Rooker uh, wrote that part. I believe it. And he's like cuddling a dove. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is my sweet baby dove. Um, that That's not as as big of an example of like, mm, sometimes the payoff at the end is the least best part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true of, I mean, love is another one that's really good. And love that we watched with William Eubank. I just recommended it to a couple of people online, but I was like, it's just good. It's just a good, simple little movie, a little vignette. And there's a, there's an ending and the ending is, I don't know, I guess you could think of it as a payoff or not. It doesn't really matter. However you want to put it together. But, you know, we don't, you don't need a movie to be big. You don't need it to end big. I don't, we get in this, it's like an arms race at this point of how much bigger, how much more convoluted, how much more plot, how much more characters, how much more of a money grab. How can we inspire religious devotion in our fans? Like that's what, you know, we just, the newest movie that came out that was a superhero movie was the Madam Web. Yeah. Which I didn't even know they were making a Madam Web movie. And then all of a sudden it was like Madam Web. And I was like, oh, they just announced it. Okay. And they're like, no, it's in theaters. I'm like, shit, I didn't even know it was coming. I didn't even know it was coming out. And everyone hates it. Okay. Yeah. Because it. From what I've heard, it just felt like a money grab. Right. And I saw they're all starting to feel like money. I grabs. saw some clips from interviews, and it was like each of the main characters answering the question with, "Oh no, I didn't really read the comics." That's because a viewer can tell when a movie is soulless. It's kind of like every human is actually capable of hearing the difference between cold running water and hot running water. You, listener, are capable of discerning between the sound of hot running water and cold running water. That's why you can tell when the shower gets hot or how you can leave the sink water running and you know when to go back and check it. You might not be aware that you are aware of that, but you are We have lots of things we are aware of that we do not have an awareness of our own awareness. And the reason these people go see these movies and they're like, I just didn't like it. Well, because you know, the person who made that made that because they were sticking to a formula they thought would capture your interest and generate revenue. Right, but it was the wrong formula. These movie juggernauts that they're trying to create are nothing more than a formulaic regurgitation of what worked in the past. And we can tell. It's possible the new Deadpool movie might be a break. Like it might be, you need something to push the medium forward. There needs to be momentum. We're not in momentum. We're stuck in this hey, but people will still go to see it because they're hoping that it's going to be good. So maybe that's enough. Maybe as long as we can make our bank on opening weekend, it doesn't matter. Like I've heard a lot of good things about the Wonka movie. Mm -hmm. And I gather it gathered steam. And it gathered steam because it was good and people told their friends and they went back and saw it. Because it was a movie that probably somebody cared about and they made it because they cared about it. I don't know that for sure. Of course I don't. I don't know anybody who was in the production team. I didn't read anything about it and I haven't seen it, but I think you can tell. And a lot of indie movies are made because the person who made them wants to make them. It's like, is it Toni Morrison who said, you have to write the book you want to read? Yep. Got it in one. If there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. So a lot of these 
movie makers, these independent movie makers are making the kinds of movies that they love and that they want to see more of. Like Blast Furnace Media that we talked to, where he had yep. made a couple of horror movies because they were the kind of horror movie he liked and he wanted to see and they were meaningful to him and he wanted to put more of that out into the universe. And you can tell, are they the best special effects I've ever seen in my entire life? No. Does everybody look like they're having a really good time and does it look like they put a lot of effort into this? Yes. Right. You can tell somebody somebody had a goal in mind. Yeah. Rather than... A goal of telling a story. Right. That wasn't just give me a paycheck. Right. And of course, artists are allowed to make money. I, again, am never saying people can't make money, but it's okay to try to tell a really good story and earn your reward from being a good storyteller and not from sticking to the formula that works. And that's the problem with AI. So a lot of major publishers are now using AI to generate book covers because you can feed it all of the current book covers for similar genres mm -hmm. and it will spit out a book cover that looks like in the spirit of all of the current book covers. Right. You will get an on-trend book cover, but you will not get an innovative book cover right. because it's not going to create a new book cover. It's going to create one based on all of the ones that were put into it. It can't create anything new. It can just reinterpret what already exists. Right. It's more like a making a collage yeah. out of things that already exist. Like I saw a video the other day that was like, uh, didn't didn't we grow up hearing that um, America is a melting pot and that the all the different um all the different cultures and all the different perspectives were gonna drive creativity and make us like the most innovative country in the world? And they were like is innovation in the room with us right now? Because <laughs> they're like, all of our phones are the same. Everybody mm. wears the same clothes. Everybody, all the books look the same because it's like a kingdom of blank and blank, a court of blank and blank. You know, that's what right. every single book is. A something of a something. A place of noun and noun. Oh, uh, yeah. A place of noun and noun. And honestly, I think I, I mentioned it on Fee, Sheath, and Shatter. There was a book I didn't read because I thought I'd already read it, and it turned out I hadn't. They just had almost the exact same cover and almost the exact same title. Right, but the cover had a person on it with, like, crossed swords It was like a an kingdom of blood something. and ash or a kingdom of battle and blade or something like that. And they were yeah. both red and black covers with crossed swords behind the text, and it was the exact same font. How am I supposed to keep up with that shit? Yeah. It is okay to be innovative. The only problem is you are more likely to fail. And I think that we have devalued failure so strongly in our culture that we 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 don't we have no room for it. Right. It's like the when I was reading the reviews about Radius on IMDb, it was very all or nothing. Well, this movie wasn't perfect. Four stars. If you're like, okay. And then I was thinking about, uh, we made a crack on Come In 81 Kilo because there used to be an email group for Come In 81, for Forever Night, because at the time forums and email routing thing, well, that was all there was. And they said, you know, like the art of cheesy rational rationalization, which implies that in the 90s when the show was airing, they were fully aware of how cheesy and awful some of the plot lines were. Yeah. But you love it anyway because you're like, oh, bless, they tried. Right. Where did that spirit go? Where did the like, wow, you really tried to tell a good story there and I see where you were going and I'm, thank you. Why is it like... Y'all, look at this still of their computer graphics. Look how shitty it is. The ending was terrible. It didn't have a payoff. The plot line didn't make sense. Jesus Christ. It's like we have forgotten that the people behind the screen are people and that they're just trying to tell. We're all sitting around the same campfire trying to tell stories, okay? Mm -hmm. And you just got to calm down and let people tell the stories. When you vilify every failure, no one tries anything new, you get Marvel, okay? You want to know how you get Marvel? You don't leave any room for failure for anybody ever. 
So the consequences of failure have become so high, it is better to not try and to fail a little than to try a lot and fail spectacularly. But then nobody tries a lot. Or even really a little. Right, right. And you always go with the safe bet. Yeah. So that's what I tell the kids all the time. What's the worst thing that could happen? You fail. Okay. Well, is that really right. all that Fail, terrible? Failing's how you learn things. I mean, is that really all that? What, is, what does that mean? Or today, our daughter took a math test, and she got two questions wrong, and she was really upset. And I was like, you used the right technique to try to solve every single problem. You just weren't accurate. You were correct. You just weren't accurate. You were trying to do it the right way. You just made a couple simple arithmetic mistakes. Don't beat mm -hmm. yourself up about that. It was like accuracy comes with time. The point is you knew how to solve the problem. You just made one small mistake doing it. Right. And so you were two or three digits off. This isn't the Mars lander. It doesn't matter if you were a couple off. In real life, if it mattered that much, you'd have people going behind you to check for accuracy. So right. don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I know we've wandered far afield yet again. I blame Matthew. You're welcome. I don't know why I blame you, but I just do. So in short, go find Radius, watch it. Hopefully you already watched it because we, we dropped the major spoiler. I am so sorry. Not sorry. We spoil all over. We spoil everything. I don't give a shit. Uh, I'm like, sorry if you were like, no, they're going to be really delicate this time when it didn't happen. No, that, that doesn't happen. Yeah. And then go find some good out of the box movies. Watch them. Support independent movie makers. Because that is where innovation lies. And we need to get more of them out. We need to get more people watching them because that will drive the rest of the movie. And you want to save the movie industry, support independent filmmakers. Right. That's where the interesting stuff happens. Yeah. I got into an interesting debate, not really debate, but I made a couple comments and then I just watched the thing flow, which was what to do about movie theaters. Cause it was a couple people from other countries where they're like, we don't see American movies right away. It takes a while for them to come here and like movie theaters are expensive and, you know, it's just difficult. And um, then there was a bunch of Americans that were like, it's really unpatriotic for you to not go see a movie in a theater because theaters are dying and we need to support them by going to see the movies in the theater. And my contribution was we have one neighborhood theater, which has like four screens. It shows half Christian movies and half regular <laughs> movies. Because we live in a post-consumer Christian cultist hellscape, and this is my reality. But like, if I want to go see a lot of new releases, I have to drive hour minimum. And then each movie is, you know, if you're watching Killers of the Flower, whatever, Killers of the Flower Moon, it's three and a half hours, which means my minimum commitment is six hours to go see this movie and then I have to provide childcare for my children while I'm gone because I can't take them to see Killers of the Flower Moon because it's got Leonardo DiCaprio and it might leap right. out of the screen. And then it's $18 a ticket. Yeah. Plus food. Yeah. Plus the gas for the two hour round trip. That is a lot. That is a lot to ask to sit in a sticky seat and have a really, uh, really high person take my ticket and then a really disgruntled person throw popcorn at me. Like, that is a lot to ask. When I could wait and it will come to the comfort of my own home for mostly free. Or yeah. extremely reduced. And I can pop my own popcorn and I can put curry on it like I like to. And I don't have to worry about going all the way out of my way to be cold in a sticky ass seat somewhere halfway across the county. Drinking flat soda. Drinking flat soda. Exactly. you got to be better than streaming and nobody's trying to be better than streaming they're just like maybe if we keep doing it wrong eventually people will just come back just come back because we deserve to continue existing but i don't know i have a lot to say about that that's one of those rabbit holes i think the star system is broken i think the box office revenue system isn't how we should measure success for movies i just think that we have we are applying old formulas to new things 
And of course they don't fit. They're different. And that's at the heart of the meaning crisis. Yeah. We haven't updated our metrics. We got to update our metrics. How much money a movie makes at the box office shouldn't matter anymore. It should have stopped mattering as soon as movies became available to watch in your own home. Yeah. It mattered when it came out on the, in the movie theater and then it just fucking disappeared into the ether. For, what, six to 18 months? And then maybe it came out on VHS? There was a time when it just went away. Oh, yeah, before... Before any kind of home television, home, you know, recording system, it just left you. So if there was a movie you were interested in, you caught it at the theater or you caught it not at all. And that is when box office mattered. But you think about like The Princess Bride. The Princess Bride bombed in theaters. Fucking bombed. Mm -hmm. It did terrible. It got like, the, it was the worst. Nobody went to see it. Period. And then as soon as it came out, came out on VHS, fucking renaissance. Everybody wanted to see it. The same thing happened with The Thing. I see so many people praising The Thing in, in the, in, on Instagram and around. Like, it's the hot horror movie that everybody's jazzed about right now. But, like, it bombed, y'all. It did terrible. I did see, remember we talked about Dune on one of our most recent episodes and I said it was like the weird uncle that everybody hated and then finally now you just think he's funny because yeah. you, you finally yeah. learned to laugh at his grossness. Somebody reviewed Dune and they were like, why does everyone keep why does everyone keep recommending this movie to me? This movie is shit. And they gave it like half a star out of five and they just had Which this, one? Dune 1980. Oh, the David Lynch Yeah, Dune? David Lynch's Dune. Yeah. And it was just it's like- not. It's not great. What the shit? They were like, it's slow. It's boring. It's convoluted. It's difficult to understand. There's tons of made up words. Nobody is delivering their line. Everybody is phoning it in. Kyle MacLachlan doesn't have facial expressions. It was just like this long list. It cracked me up. I love it so much. I love when everybody has different opinions about stuff. It's so interesting. So I think that's probably a good place to leave it. I'm, I'm glad we had this really unfocused moment, you and I. It was good. It was cleansing. Do you feel cleansed? I feel congested. <laughs> because you're sick. Oh, oh, oh. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm sitting down. <laughs> anyway, go see in TLDR. TL didn't listen. TLDL. TLDW? TLDW? No, no, not oh. watch. Listen to the listen. podcast. Oh, you, listen you, to the podcast. You fast forward to the podcast because that's where we normally wrap it up. That's a lie. I don't know what we normally do at the end. We pontificate. So we did that through the whole, <laughs> the whole episode. <laughs> oh, my God. Have we become one of those podcasts where we give bad advice? I've been thinking. We give amazing advice. We give really good advice. We follow our own advice. That's all that anybody really should ever we, ask. We've struggled through a lot. We have been through a lot. I was thinking... This leads me to my secondary point of the episode, which I was thinking we should start a Patreon series where we just talk about all the shit we've gone through and figured out. And then all of our um, all of our relationship tips for how to survive that together. Yeah. So Matt and I have been together since we were 18 and 19, respectively, since I am his child bride. <laughs> you had to find a slightly older person. To find someone as mature as you. Yeah, that's true. Yep, I really had and to. And you still failed. <laughs> well, I told you you weren't allowed to see me if you didn't do your homework. And, and, and it worked. It did work. And then we got married too young. What were we, like 21? What? 22? Got married at the perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> perfect time. Yeah, sure. Let's go with that. And then, um, yeah, and then we got stranded in Virginia for a year and a half. We were homeless for a while. Listen, we've got a lot to talk about. We've made it through it all, and somehow we still love each other, and we can podcast together. Woo. So I feel like we have a lot to say. So I don't know. Weigh in. Does anybody want to have um, Patreon episodes where Matt and I are just like, here's how to survive life, <laughs> how to survive some really wild shit? Because let's just say, when I when I expound about the virtues of failure— it is the voice of experience about how failure drives growth in your life. And it is one of the most vital and important things you can do is fail. And you should do it as often as possible because how else do you grow? 
a relevant, relevant anecdote from my life uh, for my current job, which I really enjoy, the place I work. The last question I asked at the last interview, because I had like four interviews, the last one was supposed to be a culture fit interview, not a technical interview. And this really like hard ass guy from the technical interview <laughs> was there and he, he wanted to get the last question in and he said, okay, one more question. <laughs> Everybody just looks at him <laughs> and he says, name one thing that you absolutely require to like be productive in your job. So I took a moment and I think this is probably the best like answer to like an interesting interview question. I said, the number one thing I need is the freedom to break things. I need to know that I can try out new ways of doing things that might fail and not get any negative feedback. Um, what's the word? Punishment. I had a word for it. Uh, basically not get in trouble for breaking things. Yeah. And, and I have lived up to that. Um, I've broken a lot of stuff at work, but, <laughs> but it's always been in the pursuit of finding the next, like slightly better way to do something. Yeah. And I have gained a reputation for being, um, fearless, <laughs> reckless. I, uh, okay. What, what's the, what's the positive version of reckless? <laughs> uh, <laughs> exploratory yes yeah unencumbered and it's a lesson that i've learned from just everything i've tried to do i always fail the first time yeah and then the second time i i do better and it's a pattern that works for me well there you go then that's the value of becoming comfortable with failure because it happens it's going oh, to happen and you cannot avoid it you and might a as well make side effect, a side effect that's great is when something breaks and you weren't necessarily expecting it to break, it's no big deal. Yeah. So you just deal with it rather than uh, like getting embarrassed and trying to hide the fact that you made a mistake from everybody else. That just gets no. messy and uh, it makes you look. Or if you get fired when your wife is four months pregnant with your second child. Shh. <laughs> well, that's because I was taking the exploratory attitude, exploratory strategy for success at a small startup. Yeah. Like a nine person startup. Uh, in that situation, it doesn't really work that well. Well, also your manager was a douchebag, but... Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. Go on the Instagram. Talk to me. You can plug it into the the form on the website, or you can send me an email at thehosts at strangeandbeautiful.club, and I will get it. And you can tell me um, to fuck off if you want, I guess. I probably won't care, but at least you'll get it off your chest. Or you can tell me to, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Uh, a streamer I was listening to the other day, because I words are escaping me today. Um, body doubling. Mm. Body body doubling is a strategy for motivation yeah. if you have neuros, I don't know, I like attention problems. Yeah. Uh, I use uh, like chill, like Minecraft YouTube streamers playing yeah. in the background as my version of body doubling. And there was somebody talking uh, in a video I was listening to today, and they, I think they were responding to somebody asked in their comments, like, how do you get started? And they said, oh, they were commenting because there were a lot of bots in the chat. And they said, well, that's 
kind of a marker for like success when you start getting like that one person who like subscribes to every thing you do and automatically downvotes everything you publish <laughs> and negatively <laughs> comments on every single one of your videos it means you're doing something yeah <laughs> <laughs> and especially when the bots start joining your chats and comment sections, that means you're big enough to be visible. Yeah. So if we get somebody commenting to us to fuck off, hey, that's a metric for success. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I just I would be interested to hear everybody's opinion about that. So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. I think that's a good place to end it. I think this was a beautiful little ping pong episode where we just sort of batted a ball around and had a good time with it. Yeah. We haven't had one of those in a while. We've been pretty focused, which is uh, both a marker of our maturation as podcasters, but also like, oh, I miss when we used to just shoot the shit about literally nothing, which is what we do in real life all the time, but also... Yeah. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're like much. you're like we did that like an hour before the podcast started shh, shh, honey shh. i mean on the recording on the recording so and oh you know this is the one where you do your thing so do your thing so remember sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful too so be who you are and love what you love until next time friends bye, bye.